Hi guys, welcome to this very special Alakazam video blog. I'm joined here with the marvellous John Carey. Um, we're going to have a bit of a chat, so guys, uh, without further ado, um, let's get started. Hi guys, welcome to this week's Alexan video blog. You will notice that this week I do not have Harry here with me. I have the imitable uh, John Kerry. Nice to see you, bud. You well? Hey, yeah, mate. Yeah. What's imitable, mate? Uh, it means the marvellous, uh, the the irreplaceable. No, I'm blushing. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so, John, uh, you have just returned from a, a mega tour of Australia and New Zealand, haven't you? Yeah, just over a week ago. It was a month-long lecture tour. Plus some holiday time uh -huh. as well uh, in New Zealand and Australia. An amazing experience. Uh, did five lectures in uh, different cities in New Zealand and the same amount in Australia, uh, plus finished off at the wonderful Brisbane Assembly Convention that Sean Piper over there organises. Yeah. I had an amazing time. I met so many lovely people and the lecture was very well received yeah. on many levels and uh, took me about a week to get over the jet lag. It hit me like that, you know. Yeah. But truly... Uh, truly honoured to have done that and uh, to anybody from over there and any new friends I've made or existing friends thank you so much for your hospitality. Well you, you certainly um, you've been with us what an hour now I think uh, before we started filming this and uh, you were bu you were still buzzing about your time away uh, what, what were the highlights for you I mean obviously an experience like that it must be hard to pick. Oh, just everything ones. no just just the experience of meeting lovely people like-minded people and uh, literally hopping around. I mean, it was including the two long haul. Well, it was two long haul flights going via Dubai, London, Dubai, du Dubai to Auckland, New Zealand to begin with. Right. Plus the Brisbane, Dubai, Dubai, London. Add on to that 11, uh, 11 or twelve internal flights. I was. I felt like Alan Wicker. Uh, older uh, viewers will re remember Alan Wicker. You know. Where in the world are we? Yeah, you, do, you, do you know what? You know, now that you said that, I remember Alan Wicker, which uh, mm, makes me feel old. Really. It was a time <laughs> and me, mate. Uh, it was the time zones though that. Uh, really threw me. Yeah. Uh, I was all right for the first few days. It was weird, I was getting up at like half past five, six o'clock in the morning, which is unheard of back here. Um, but as Peter said to me during a, a Facebook Messenger conversation, he said, enjoy it while you can, mate, that's the jet lag, because mm -hmm. it can give you a lift in energy, because yeah. it's 11 hours time difference between Auckland and the UK, uh -huh. which is extreme. Yeah. You know? Then it hit me a bit, but then I was, I'm just going around city to city, meeting so many lovely people, little hour internal flights around New Zealand yeah. for the first week, eight days or so, nine days. And then my friend Jonathan Usher over there, uh, him and his lovely lady Lisa and their daughter Amy put me up for a week's holiday in Otago on South Island. Right. And if you guys have never been to South Island, it is truly phenomenal. It's where Lord of the Rings was filmed. Mm -hmm. um, they've got a beautiful big house and it's right by a lake, snow peak mountains. It was absolutely gorgeous. Right. Oh, the count yeah, has gone over. The count has gone over. Even it's gone down. <laughs> no, 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 it's gone up. And... Um, we had an amazing time, and that was great because it broke the tour up with some vacation time. I went to Queenstown. We went to Queenstown, which is an amazing place where they got the shot over jet, probably the fastest and most exciting jet boat ride in the world. Yeah. Where you're almost, you can almost within touching distance of rocks, and then the guy slows down and then does 360s, kind of like oh, wow. the, the boat equivalent of a donut spin, like a, you know, in a car. Uh -huh. Absolutely freaking phenomenal. Uh -huh. um, and went up in a thing called the Gondola, a big cable car ride up there. That was amazing. Uh, but the night times used to amaze me there because outside we, we were having barbecues and beers and just relaxing and talking magic. Yeah. I'm just looking up at the stars in the sky. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I've never seen so many stars in all my life. Right. It was almost like they were morphing before my eyes. Right. And there were so many stars, Andy, they were almost clustered like uh, in big star balls almost is the way of describing right. it. Right. Of course, yeah. we don't we don't get that very much in the UK because obviously we, we have, especially in uh, places like big cities and stuff, the, the, the street lights have pretty much killed that, yeah, that sort of aspect. Yeah, absolutely. And you could hear a pin drop there, you know, and uh, it was just amazing. I uh, got to see some other lovely things there. In Australia, it was great. Uh, bearing in mind, it wasn't hot out there. It's their winter over there, but it wasn't freezing cold like British winters can be. Mm -hmm. uh, got out to see kangaroos for the first time and koalas in Perth, right. both out in their natural habitat and at Perth Zoo, which was amazing. Yeah, I mean, two hours just looking at the Australian section alone of Perth Zoo. There was yeah. an African and an Asian section, right. but we just did the Australian section. It was just amazing. Kangaroos, so tame. You can literally go right up to them. Wow. The koalas are all in the tree, all asleep. They're nighttime creatures, all curled up in like little balls it's so amazing and I saw chameleons and in glass cabinets I saw all kinds of weird looking frogs I saw 
spiders and things like that, thankfully enclosed. I even yeah. saw a dingo, right. would you believe? Right. Scary looking so and so, you know. Oh, I bet they are. I think they said another word there. But yeah, you know yeah, you refrained, you refrained, you stopped yourself, which yeah. is good. Yeah. So, wow, what, what an experience. And yeah. uh, even though you've had this experience and you're back here, you are going to be jetting off again soon, I, as I understand. Uh, well, a couple of months downtime, well, there's always stuff to be done, uh, done, you know, get the new book finished, ready for December. Yeah. Um, then I'm off to the East Coast of America mid September for a few weeks doing a tour over there. Wow. So I'm looking forward to that. Do you sleep? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. Right, okay. I do. I, I do sometimes. wonder this sometimes. Uh, yeah, I do wonder this sometimes. You're always so so full of energy. You know, you come down here, you you see us, and uh, it's just like a whirlwind of, of fun because you you come. Well, this in. is fun, mate. As I've documented before in the past with Pete, this is this is fun. I'm doing something I love. You know, and I get to travel, and meet so many nice people, and that and that's it. And and you know. it is always we were we were talking uh, to a customer just before you arrived here today. Yeah. Um, and Peter said, "Oh, we've got John Kerry in a little while." And uh, this gentleman just stops in his tracks, and he went, John Carey's coming here. And we were like, yeah. He was like, oh, right, okay. And his wife's going, yeah, but you, you can't hang around because we need to get to the, because they were down here for a holiday. We need to get down to Rye for a holiday. Oh, and he's like, oh, right, okay. And Peter hit the nail on the head. He said, you know, he always makes a smile when he comes in. We, we have such fun afternoons when John's, John's yeah, in. Yeah, I don't, you take, I don't take myself seriously. I just love, I love to have a laugh and, mm-hmm. and a joke. My humour sometimes is a bit strange, even by my, you know, but I, I'm just me. I love magic. I love performing magic, teaching magic. Yeah. I think the teaching's taken over for me in a few last few years, especially since uh, Peter approached me to do the academies and, yeah. uh, and what have you. And uh, um, there's going to be some news on the academy front soon, but I'm not saying anything else. <laughs> yeah, it will be. It will Something be a little bit different. It will be released soon. So, um, look, um, the reason that I got you in here today is because I was speaking to Jen and Peter last night uh, on Messenger, mm. and um, it's it's always lovely speaking to you one on one about uh, about books, oh, about yes. uh, your writings, uh, the sort of magic that you're approaching, and all, all sorts of different things. Mm-hmm. And I sent you an email. Uh, well, I sent you a messenger this morning, and I said to you, John. What are your top ten favourite magic books? And that was at seven thirty a.m. That this was morning, at seven thirty a.m. I was actually up, uh, <laughs> but it took me half an hour for the coffee to kick in before I replied. Yeah, I gave you a list of ten. But I said to you in the studio next yeah. door a while ago. I could have easier done twenty or more, you know. Yeah. But uh, the ones I've I've covered there, and you've got the list there. Uh, I think people will find interesting. Um, some they'll they'll probably think, yeah, that's what I would have thought. Of. Maybe others not. And yeah. Uh, we can talk about that in a bit if you want. Okay, so um, let's let's have a look at the list. Um, I I completely understand why you've gone with this uh, at, at the top of the list, um, and I haven't asked you whether you've done these in degree of importance. But no, this is a this is a list of ten. This is not in any, as I say on the PGT, not in any particular order. Okay, uh, but it's interesting that the first one that you wrote is a book that I think we would all agree should be in every magician's library, and that is the Royal Road to Card Magic. Yeah, a book that was written what 60, 70 years mm-hmm. ago now. Yeah, uh, but it's not dated. There is material in there. If you learn those fundamentals, there is material in there you can make a living out of mm-hmm. still to this day. Right. And the reason it's so good is, and I've talked about this with the academy before. It's chapterized as lessons. Yeah. You know, you've got the first section on the overhand shuffle, just how to regularly shuffle a pack of cards, then how to run the top card to the bottom, the bottom card to the top, mm-hmm. keep the card on the bottom with a slip shuffle, yeah. run it back to the top, and then and then some tricks that go with that basic section. Then you've got the overhand shuffle uh, two se- uh, chapter yeah. with further tricks. So it gives you the tools and it gives you some applications. Yeah. And I had a great teacher, the late great Kevin Ray, who actually took me through each of those chapters and showed me what that stuff should look like. Yeah. You know, one of the finest card magicians I think I've ever, uh, I know I've ever seen, you know, a dear friend. Do you, do you think, and, I, I, and I'm sure I know the answer to this, <coughs> um, and immediately I say it, you're going to give me the, the answer I think you're going to say uh, or respond with. And that is that um, a lot of times when people are getting into magic, um, and we'll, come, we'll go through a couple of other, what I would say, more advanced books uh, mm-hmm. in a little while. Um, when they come to, to magic books, they tend to dive in with the latest and the and the greatest, so to speak. And it, it's almost yeah. as if things like Royal Road to Card Magic kind of go under the, the radar. They do, bit. they do. And some people jump in and some people are amazingly talented and get into magic and come in it, the, I suppose, the wrong way. There's no real wrong way or right way, but, or maybe there is. Um, and they, they, they can 
amazingly learn advanced stuff straight mm. off. Yeah. But a lot of people would do that and it won't work for them, I guarantee it. Mm. You know, um, it's because there's so much choice out there. Yeah. At times there's too much choice out there. Yeah. It's uh, information overload, yeah. in my opinion. It really, really is information overload. And unless you've got the benefit of a mentor or a go to a magic club or you've got a few buddies you have regular magic sessions with, you make decisions and they're not qualified decisions. Maybe you think, oh, I'll get that book. And then you find, you get frustrated because that stuff's too difficult. Yeah. I've lost count how many times I've said on this camera, you've got to have that foundation. Yeah. You know, to build that house. Yeah. I know it's cliche, mate, but it's so, so no, true. No, it, it completely makes sense. And so I guarantee people results, you know, like people who come to me privately, you know, I said, just, I, I'm not always right, I said, but if you stick with me for a few months and do it like I told you, I said, I guarantee you'll be doing better card work than Pete. I'm not being big-headed, I'm just saying, you'll be doing better card work than the majority. Yeah. Because you're learning those basic building blocks. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. It's just like learning to play the chords on a guitar. Yeah. You don't just go straight into it, you yeah. have to learn, you know? And they're, they're called foundations for, for a reason. They are. Because you build on, you build on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the back of that, uh, one of the other books that you mentioned uh, was the Card College series. Yeah, which is basically what Roberto Jobby's done there, and that's all five volumes I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And also the, I didn't mention it, the uh, the Card College Light, Lighter and Lightest, which are the semi-automatic smaller editions. Yeah. But just the main Card College uh, volumes, volume one reminds me of Royal Road. Again, mm -hmm. chapterized in a way that they're lessons. Yeah. Again, like on the overhand shuffle and some effects, key cards and some effects. He's given you, he's given you, he's literally given you all the work you need but also encouraging you not to jump ahead. Yeah. Stay with that chapter one, keep going through it, going through it, going through it, make notes, and then bef and then when you feel you're ready, yeah. after all audience and field testing, the, these are things, then go on to chapter two. It's so easy. We're all guilty of it. Imagine this is a book. We're so guilty of doing this and flicking through books like this, thinking, oh, ambitious aces, okay, oh, thinker card, yeah, that looks good. And then suddenly you notice a prop you've bought, oh, I'll play with this first, and, you, yeah. and then you don't come back to that. Yeah, yeah. You know? It just you just have to try to instill a little bit of discipline and focus. Now, one thing a lot of people say to me, people who are very busy with their 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 professional lives, their jobs, and they've got family like like your good self is, oh, I don't have the time. Yes and no. Everybody can find the time. If you can find just two half an hour blocks a week, half an hour, yeah. two nights or two times of the week to put in a practice session, and you make it good practice. You know, you don't want it to be bad practice where you're learning bad habits and making bad habits look even better. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody can do that, I'm sure. I'm sure of it, you know? Yeah, and... Not um, everybody's got hours, but everybody can focus a little bit of time. And I, to I totally time. support that. I mean, you know, when I, any time I'm working on a slight, what I tend to do is if I want to spend time with my wife, um, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, we may be watching TV, She'll sit there watching TV. I'll be kind of paying attention to what's going on. Be like cards with I will have cards on my in my hands. So Absolutely, you can practice moves while at the movies stuff. or while watch watching TV. And like if you're with a family and it's not doing much of that program, you know, you, everybody can sh you can just shuffle and practice your palms or practice your controls. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, also you can practice a lot in your head. Once you've got these tools down, you can just visualize. You can do visualization practice. Actually, practicing without the props. Yeah. That can help. Yeah. That can help, you know. Um, one of the things that you mentioned there with uh, Card College, uh, which I think is... is it's like a, a postgraduate course in card magic. It's it's kind of... Because Royal Road was written back in the day, so the, the language of Royal Road is maybe a bit dated, but the information is still wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and with Card College, it is a, it is a natural leap between the two. But one of the important things about Card College is that, like you said, it's, it's very... Um, methodical in its approach, mm. but also you get you get illustrations which are crisp and clear as well, which support the written text. Absolutely, um, and bullet points that are at the end, and more importantly, I think, and I think this is this is a great approach to write in any magic book, is to have an effect that you're learning the slight uh, with, because we, you know, if you're just sitting there reading the slight, you might go, oh right. What do I do with it? Mm -hmm. Now at least you've got something where you might be learning a double lift, for example. Mm -hmm. Roberto Joby has one or two effects that you can immediately put into implementation. If you've got an application, you need an application for that move, otherwise you're just learning moves for yeah. move's sake. Yeah. Busting out moves can be fun, but you, you want, ideally you want an application for that move. Yeah, exactly. After a while, because after a while you're just trying to move on to something else. Yeah. You want an application for that move that you can go out and work for friends, family, or if you, if you do paid work at gigs, 
get results, you know? Yeah. Maybe not the best results you want, but when you do it more, you get better. Yeah. Because you've got to find somewhere to be bad. Yeah. Get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. It's all, it's all a progression or a journey. Yeah, and a learning cur- curve. And a curve as yeah. well, yeah. So um, two, two books that I'm sure that you'll agree are uh, books that everybody should, should study because they, re- they truly do lay down the foundations for, for good card magic. Um, moving on from that is uh, one of my favorite magicians and I'm sure would account for 98 magician, 98% of the magicians out there and that is uh, Di Vernon material. Oh, the Vernon material. I mean, I moved on to the Vernon material after after two years with Royal Road. Yeah. So two years with Royal Road, the gentleman I, I mentioned, the late, great Kevin Ray, he then uh, introduced me to the Vernon material. Mm-hmm. I had a big advantage because Kevin, because we had no internet back then. Yeah. It was almost like I was getting the internet kind of in, uh, for real, almost yeah. in front of me, seeing what the effects like twisting the aces and Vernon's linking rings and the free ball routine with a pop-up move and yeah. all the great Vernon material should look like. Yeah. Um, I've mentioned on our list the Inner Secrets trilogy, as it's now called. Yeah. They originally come out as more further and Inner Secrets, more in, Inner Secrets and further Inner Secrets. But uh, LNL Publishing some years ago put them out as a trilogy in a nice big book, yeah. which I believe you can still get today. Yeah. And uh, one of the other books that you mentioned as well, um, whilst it, we're talking about Vernon, is The Ultimate Secrets of Card Magic. Ultimate Card Secrets as well. You don't want to be rushing into those books. So you want to get your foundation with Royal Road or Card Vo- College Volume 1. Yeah. Uh, if you get the Card College series, don't jump, just get volume one to begin with. Yeah. There's enough in there to keep you going for a couple of years. And again, if you really focus and don't jump ahead of yourself, and you, uh, and you truly do play by the rules, so to speak, as I always say, you'll be doing better work than the majority of people. Yeah. Because a lot of people get sidetracked, as I was always saying. They, there's so much choice. It's like, oh, I'll try this. Oh, no. Oh, that's better. Oh, oh I've got my sponges over there. Yeah. Sorry to repeat myself, but it is no, a point I think worth it's, uh, reiterating. I, and I think it's true. I think it, you know, it is a, a point that is worth going over a, a few times. Because one thing I always do when I'm working on new material is I sometimes, well, I'm like a dog with a bone. If I work on a particular plot, I won't let go of that plot until I'm, I'm finished. Mm-hmm. You know, I might work on a mystery card plot or an, eight, or an assembly plot, and for maybe a, a week or less or maybe a bit more, I won't work on anything else other than that. Yeah. Until I'm happy. You you do strike me. Um, you do strike me in the in the time that I've known you in the the talks that we had or, or I've had um, very much a uh, a student of Vernon in the sense that you you take effects uh, and like you said you work on them until you're you're happy with them. Mm-hmm. Um, but also you and I've said this before on camera uh, as well. You 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 strip back the un- you take out the unnecessary faff for want of a better word, but you don't lose any of the effect. Well, hopefully you don't, you don't lose the impact, again, as I've mentioned countless times before. I mean, Vernon actually uh, went on record as saying he, he spent the latter years of his life, the, the last sort of 20, 30 years of his life, trying to eliminate moves. Yeah. You know, there's always a, there's always a trade-off, there's always a price to pay. If yeah. I have to do a tough move, yeah, I will do a tough move if it's the best tool for a job. Yeah. Uh, but if a subtlety can get me there without losing the impact, yeah. I'm in for subtlety. Yeah, yeah. Or something a, li- a little bit less uh, slight intensive. Yeah. Sleight of hand is about problem solving. It's not to showboat how clever you are. Yeah. It's about solving problems. Yeah. Using the best tools for the job. Yeah. Key cards, crimps, controls, uh, whatever, you know. And I think this is one of the benefits of being well read in magic. You know, if you're well read in magic, you have. Uh, the resources at your disposal mm-hmm. to, to be able to then decide what the best tools are for the job. Yes. Um, because if you only follow a, a, a path, mm-hmm. which is, you know, I'm not interested in any other material apart from, uh, let's say, Ed Marlow material, mm-hmm. um, then you're not going to know whether other other people's uh, contributions are going to be ones that are going to be stronger or, or better suited to your personality. Absolutely, because otherwise you'll have a one-sided magical education. Yeah. It's good to, and we've talked uh, on the list there, I've covered like the works of the Royal Road, Hugh Garden, Browie, the Vernon Works, uh, Marlowe's Cardition, yeah. which was a great book, uh, yeah. still is a great book, yeah. um, and uh, Je- the Jennings work and what have you. All these people are the giants, you know, the people, my, my heroes, yeah. you know, and uh, I can't tell you how much pleasure those, those works have given me over the years. So Jennings, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned Jennings because Jennings comes up next. He was a student of Vernon, as you know. Yeah, and uh, much in the same way that Michael Vincent talks about the chain of excellence, I can see the pattern Yeah. Uh, the, the pattern here. Um, so the classic magic of Larry Jennings, 
a, it's not an easy book it's uh, not, by any means. And I actually, uh, I actually got that. Uh, I actually got that a little bit before I was ready for it. Actually, right. and dear old Kev, Kevin Ray actually said to me, "John, uh, some tough stuff in there. I got it myself recently, and even I'm struggling with some of it." Yeah. So it took a couple of three years before that started to make sense. Some of those, uh, some of those effects. Yeah. But the plots are great in the Jennings. The plots books. are great. Yeah. He had a really great creative mind. I think. Uh, with all due respect to the late great Larry Jennings, I think some of the handlings uh, were maybe like, because Larry had that vehicle, he had the magic castle where the boys wanted to see him bust out the work. Yeah. I think some of the effect, effects are a bit overhandled maybe, yeah. with hindsight. Yeah. But that's what people wanted to see Larry do, the moves. Yeah. Well, hopefully not see the moves, but see him working. You yeah, know he, I mean? he, they, they wanted to see uh, the top sleight of hand magician do the top sleight of hand. Yeah, and apparently he had hands the size of a grizzly bear, but such a soft, gentle touch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which leads me on to, to something that uh, I've always uh, admired, um, and I'm not just saying this because you're sitting here. Uh, you are a very, uh, you put a deck of cards in your hand and you are very very gentle with them very gentle with them uh, I've seen you perform uh, you perform effects to me obviously I've seen you perform on camera um, and perform live to other people mm -hmm. and you are very gentle with the deck of cards um, well one thing I will thank you one thing I will say is uh, when holding a deck like in this grip example you want to hold it just barely enough so that if somebody comes over and does that the pack falls to the table mm -hmm. Because one thing a lot of magicians have trouble with is uh, they don't have soft hands. And what do I mean by soft hands? There's too much tension in the hands. Yeah. The grip on the deck is like they're holding a grenade that's primed to go off. Yeah. Or they're, they're doing all this kind of stuff, which you know I don't enjoy no. watching that. I think that's just basically nerves or whatever, you know? Yeah. But learning how to just spread a pack, you know, elegantly, just simply, rather than, rather than doing this to pick a card, for example, I learned watching the Spanish school and the Italian magicians over the years, you know, they're just sort of, it's like a tray. Yeah. It's like a waitress saying, would you like an hors d'oeuvre, you know? Yeah. Uh, even the way you just cut cards, you know, doing it with precision or neatness or, 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 a, or a shuffle, you know, just the act of dribbling the cards, you know. Yeah. Aesthetically, it's pleasing on the eye. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing all this kind of stuff, yeah. It can create a, a blur yeah. for the spectators, I think. Yeah, and if if we're aiming for um, what we're doing... Also, to it makes sleight of hand a lot easier. The, lo the, looser, the looser the grip, yeah. generally, the easier sleight of hand is, Yeah, and, in, my, in my experience. And it comes across more natural. And, it, and if we're aiming to be magicians in the truest sense of mm -hmm. the word, yeah. then we wouldn't hold cards the way that most magicians would hold cards, like the way you just described it. Yeah. We would hold them nice and loosely. Mm. Um, Hello, Dave. <laughs> uh, almost as if, uh, almost as if, you know, these are these are an everyday thing. Oh, well, they are. They're an everyday thing that we, we carry mm. about with us. We wouldn't take the keys out of our pocket and hold them mm. like in a death grip. Mm -hmm. We would just take them out, unlock yeah. the door, put them away again. And mm -hmm. if we're gonna perform magic with a prop, you know, yeah, take yeah. it out, do what you're going to do. These with are it. becoming more, and you must have experienced this because you do a lot of weddings and private do's. Uh, do's is an English word for parties, by the way, <laughs> for friends in America and elsewhere. Um, where these are becoming more of an oddity, like especially to the younger generation who've never held a pack of cards no, before. No. You know, whereas our kind of age group, mid, late 40s, 50s upwards, uh, they're a common thing. We grew up with a pack of cards in the drawer at home or down the pub, didn't we? That's it, yeah. You know? um, so that's something you have to address when you're presenting your card work because some people may have never uh, held a pack of cards or played a game of cards before. No. But then you can change your presentations around and educate people. And also, I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but this is worth uh, repeating something I say in my lectures all the time. When you're doing effects where spectators have got to do certain physical actions with cards, like counting or dealing, be, be sympathetic to the spectator. Don't just assume that they know how to do these things we take for granted. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that's going off on a tangent. No, no, it's, it's I, worth mentioning. again they're they're, they're valid points. I mean there's nothing worse <coughs> than there's nothing worse than the look of fear in a spectator's face when you give them a deck of cards. Oh, it's like shuffle and this and I say but I can't shuffle, I say just do the best you can, it yeah, doesn't exactly. matter, you know? Yeah, and because if you're giving them a pack to shuffle, you're not working with a stack, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Or just say give them a cup. Yeah. Anything is good. And remember that you know you, these are things to be aware of when you're approaching customers. Mm -hmm. And you, you're quite right, John. You give them a deck of cards; they, they, it is almost like a foreign object to them. And because unless they're that, experienced card players, yeah. Um, but in which case, great. But even then, some experienced card players still don't really know how to shuffle a deck of mm -hmm. cards. Yeah, they um, might be a bit wishy washy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just having that little bit of foresight to to kind of take on board what they're what they're feeding back to you and, and mm -hmm. deal with it accordingly. 
Um, so you, I said about the, the softness of touch here. Mm. Uh, one uh, one school of magic which I think has become more and more predominant over the course of the last, I don't know, eight years plus, mm. um, has been the Spanish school. I know that you are a big Danny Dilters fan. Um, He's as become as a very good friend, I'm pleased to say. I'm honoured to say he's an amazing human being, first and foremost. Yeah. Um, his success has not changed him in any way, shape or form. No. He travels the world sharing sharing uh, his philosophy, which is heavily influenced by who he calls his father in magic, Juan Tamariz. Yeah. And um, he hasn't changed since I first met him like seven, eight years ago at yeah. the session convention. Yeah. You were there with Keith I, and wife and the boys, weren't I you? I was at the session convention. That 45 minute session he did there. Was the, the, one of the most amazing magical experiences I've never laughed ever. so much in all my life. I've never been fooled so much in all my yeah. life. I went out to ring my friend Gary Middleton in Scotland afterwards. And I'm not kidding you, I felt like I was hallucinating. Mm -hmm. Gary said to me, John, you're blah, blah, uh, drunk or something. I said, no, I said, I'm just drunk on the sheer power of this man's personality and his work. And yeah, Danny's style is very loose and liberated, chaotic almost style. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were under the impression up to a few years ago that everything Danny does is improvised. He's, he's, he's a clever guy. Yeah. There's always a starting point. There's always a finishing point. Sometimes yeah. in between, he might go off on tangents. Yeah. Um, but he, uh, he always says the spectators make the session which is his way of saying, um, you know, it's the spectators who make the magic. Yeah. You know, rather than you going up to a group and trying to blow their mind with, look at me, boom, 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 you know. Mm. Close up magic should be interactive. Yeah. Yeah, there's times and places where you do a visual thing, maybe yeah. as an icebreaker. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and uh, but it's the experience, the people. Yeah. And, and Danny's psychology, use of psychology, uh, is just phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, the times you and I have seen him, for example, where he... He apparently gives a spectator the chance to change their mind. Yeah. They won't change their mind. He's just got them psychologically yeah. hooked on the fishing line, you know? Yeah. It's, 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 it's hard to describe. You his know? performances are very much at, uh, an attack in all directions. You know, you're yeah. being bombarded with the, with the psychological warfare. You're being bombarded with uh, magic techniques that are in place um, and the whole experience. The use of linguistics as well to alter the timeline of an effect of when the pack was shuffled, when the pack was cut. Yeah. You know, making making what is not a fault of card into a fault of card, making a, a, a chosen card into a fault of card purely through linguistics so that later on you really do get the illusion that, that a card was fought of rather than maybe, you know, a stop procedure or something like that, yeah? Yeah. Um, Incredible stuff. Even at the session this year, uh, when but even before he walked out on stage, yeah, uh, people were, were literally chewing at the bit to try and get up on stage with him and if I recall I remember that it was, um, uh, I think Matt King went up there and John Archer didn't they? Matt King and John Archer he asked for some people out of the audience they literally they, dived up there they, they practically leapt off of their seats yeah I've never seen Johnny Archer move so fast bless him um, and that yeah. just goes to show you the kind of influence that this gentleman has had oh, he's a trailblazer he really really is but he hasn't changed one bit and all the Spanish people like that I toured in Spain for a couple of weeks last uh, year September first week of October and there's just a there's just a family-like camaraderie amongst all of them across that beautiful country. Yeah, uh, Madrid is kind of like the magical epicenter of card magic, but it's it's flourishing everywhere you go over there. Yeah, and there's no there's there's no surprise to me why they consistently do so well at major international competitions like FISM, because they really are students of the art and the focus. You know, not just the technicalities how to do, or you know, not just a case of collecting secrets. Oh, I've learned that one now. Let me just try and oh, I'll get this one now. Let me learn that. Yeah. They will work on one effect as a group, yeah. like a group thing, you know, and, uh, and and challenge each other to to improve that effect. Yeah. They might have a session one week on the ambitious card, another week on oil and water, another week on Paul Curry's out of this world, yeah. and they all bring something different to the table. Yeah. And it's remarkable what you can do when you get like minds come together like that with a passion. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why they are so good. And of course, Lovely people. Of course, the, the spearhead at the, the front of this, um, and you've already mentioned his name, is Juan Tamaris. Absolutely. Um, now, I, I think, you know, there's no denying that Tamaris's influence uh, on magic certainly for this last couple of years because he is one of the last of the living legends. He uh, really is. Uh, Juan is up there with Vernon Marlow, yeah. Skinner, uh, Slidini, uh -huh. Fraxon, uh, and people before that, you know. Yeah. Um, truly is. Such a giving, loving man. Yeah. Um, an absolute genius. An absolute genius, you know. Uh, 
and we've both had the pleasure of seeing him a number of times over oh, yeah. the years where he will f- one doesn't just fool you he fools you bad yeah, you know? yeah. and, he, yeah, and uh, more importantly when you're being fooled you, you're having such a good time it, it's not as you if are. Well, Danny you, mentions when you and this is pure wine again the influence of wine when you're laughing when you're laughing your backside off at something during a performance you can't be thinking method at the same time no you cannot process two pieces of information at the same time so if you're me and you're rolling with laughter as daddy's doing a routine yeah whatever he's doing sort of covertly goes straight under your radar yeah and i know for a fact he's done that to you he's done that to me and, and you're one of the most knowledgeable people i know you well, know with cards and close up so with regards to uh one time said, yeah um, you've you've mentioned um you've mentioned him for Three times out of your out of your list. Yep, and um, there's reasons why for that, and we'll discuss those. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look at the five points in magic then. Yeah, the what? five points in magic. I, I bought this many many years ago at the International Magic Convention, Ron McMillan's convention, when mm-hmm. when dear Ron was alive, and uh, I got this book. And um, my first thoughts were going home on the train that night. Uh, uh, this is this is quite different to the magic books I already own. Mm-hmm. But there were some tricks in there. There was three or four tricks in it, very good tricks. But it was more about you and uh, and the magic, the use of expression. You know, smiling, different expressions, uh, connection with the people. Yeah. Juan talks about the threads, the invisible threads between your eyes and the spectators, and yeah. you must retain that connection from the beginning of the performance to the end of the performance. The use of the hands. You know, if you ever watch Danny or Juan or some of the Spanish school, uh, as they're known these days, the use of like this it means like. Look, I'm not doing anything. Everything is fair. Yeah, you're doing everything. You yeah. know, it's almost like a, uh, almost like a magical sign language. You know, and the use, the uses of the fingers and everything, and aesthetically very, very strong, very pleasing actions. Um, the Tamaris book is just is great, and he talks about uh, things like developing character and everything. You know, look in the mirror and make different expressions. One for happy, one for sad, one for seriously cheesed off. Yeah, which is a way of saying uh, very mad, <laughs> mad at something or angry and things like that. And you know, um, it's not the easiest book to read, but once you get into it, there's some absolute gold in there. You know, it actually took a few years for that stuff to actually kind of work for me. Yeah, you know, as I was finding my way. Yes, yeah. it won't just work for you straight away, but after a while, those those lessons in there really will work well for you. Yeah, and yeah. guys, you know, we're, we're not just saying this um, because because we're trying to... Uh, Taking your magic, turning straw into gold, that's what the five points in magic Yeah, and I think that that's the important thing to re- remember. <coughs> um, the, the three uh, Tamarind book, Tamarind books that you've mentioned here, uh, which include The Magic Way and The Magic Rainbow, the newest book, Yeah, they are theoretical books. They are. Hands up, I've not read all the Magic Rainbow yet, but it's like 600, 650 pages. Yeah. But the first three or four chapters alone, if you read those and study those really, really earnestly, really sincerely, yeah. they only help you make, make you a better magician. Yeah, and that, that's the point. I mean, you know, um, theory, uh, all right, you, it's, we, all, we all, since school, it's not something that you want to be sort of pressed to, to really think about is the theory behind stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can understand why a lot of people would switch off as soon as you mention theory. But honestly... You know, um, we're not just saying this because we love the books. There are plenty of other magicians out there, top flight magicians, that rave about these books because they contain, as you say, the information that will turn your, will, will increase your magic um, effectiveness. Absolutely. Because let's face it, we've all got too, far too many tricks, if we're honest. Yeah. If you can improve those effects purely from the presentational side or the use of psychology or, or linguistics and all those little pieces, all those little components, you know, that's where the theory, the work that Wine's done all the work for us. Yeah. You know, don't try to rush through that book, by the way, but do honestly make notes as well, either digitally on your phones or iPads or whatever, or old school with a notepad as mm-hmm. well. It will help you make you become a better magician. It'll help you become a better thinker as well. Yeah. You know, some people say, I, oh, I'm not sure, I just kind of do my tricks, which is fine, have fun, and they get reactions. But just think about how you can take what you already do and make it better, not through changing the components, the, the, the moves or, or the routine per se, but changing how you're perceived yeah. when you perform the routine, putting in the pauses, putting in the, uh, the little bits of fun, the little bits of comedy, you know. Because uh, strong magic, as Vernon said years ago, you don't have to be a comedian to make people laugh with magic. Because no. sometimes a laugh is a release mechanism for the spectators, where the card changes in their hand. Yeah. How many times have you had that happen at a gig? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and you learn about these things. Um, yeah, like John said, 
uh, Tamaritz uh, and other magicians such as Vernon and uh, Darwin Ortiz, those sort of people, um, they've already they've already done the work for you. The tools are there Absolutely. to take advantage of. Um, think about what you're doing. Thinking about the way that you can make your magic stronger. You know, you, it's the the tricks that are there that you're playing around with, and you think to yourself, do you know what? That's that's really strong, but I'm surprised it didn't get a stronger reaction. Mm -hmm. Well, it might get a stronger reaction if there's some things that you kind of read about. And well, one thing you can improve in performance. Uh, I'm only talking from close up now. Well, from every performance, but as a close up guy, predominantly a card guy. It's to slow down in performance. Yeah. Put pauses in. Yeah. Let the magic breathe. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than just delivering a load of uh, uh, spiel at people and not giving them time to react. You know. Yeah. And if you watch people like Tamaritz or Danny Dortes, there are these moments like like you said where mm. they they react. Yeah. And they they almost open out their arms as if to say, mm. "This is it." At the, the, at the end of an effect, yeah. this is what I presented to you, and you you feel this immediate rush. And we have been in the audience when when they've performed live. Yeah. You feel this immediate rush of wow. Yeah, you know, it is. I have it, just watched magic. It <laughs> is. Well, that forty five minute set we talked about earlier. Seriously, I I seriously felt like I was hallucinating at certain mm -hmm. points where cards were appearing. Where you know, and I thought I knew my stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I felt totally. I was schooled. Yeah, big time. You know. Yeah, but in the greatest way possible. Yeah, and and I think that's it. You 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 when you're in that moment. I mean, you and Mike and Keith were buzzing afterwards. We we were, yeah, we we were on that for like a couple of <laughs> days. Right. To be honest, that beer I'm sure went down well that night. They, it yeah. did very well. Yes, it drowned our sorrows because well, we were just anyway. so entertained. Yeah. Um, so uh, you said about um, let's face it, we don't need any any more tricks. Um, yes and no. I I one one question then because you've put down a, an Ed Marlowe. Uh, book in here, uh, the Cardition, mm -hmm. uh, which we both know has uh, tons of great, uh, great stuff in it. Um, as Not the easiest mm -hmm. book to learn from. No, but you need you need that foundation. Don't jump to the Cardition until you've got your Royal Road or your Card College. But like I, I think oh. you know it's great that you've put an Ed Marlowe thing in there because anybody hears the name Ed Marlowe and I think they immediately assume a, a difficult sleight of hand stuff that is reserved for for. The, the ranks of magicians that you know some of Marlowe's stuff was extremely technical another book you should add to that list is the revolutionary car technique series yeah. which is now in a big hardbound has uh -huh. been for a number of years as you yeah. know it originally came out as little booklets yeah and he discusses uh, the side steel you know and uh, work with a peak and uh, different types of palms yeah but Marlowe was very very creative and created some very powerful commercial routines which weren't particularly difficult no a lot of people just assumed he was all about tenkai palms and and weird kind of lateral palms and things like that but he yeah. wasn't and if you want to if um if you <coughs> want to see it in action check out the Malone meets Marlowe DVDs absolutely the best money I bought those like, I remember mum and dad treating me to those a number of years ago when they come out and I couldn't wait to get down to Peter and pick them up. Yeah. That was my birthday present. Yeah. And, and and Pete had them there waiting for me. And when I got home that night, I was up to about four in the morning. I went through every volume. Yeah. You know, it was incredible. I yeah. mean, and Bill really picked out some absolute gold on there. And, and they will perfectly highlight, like you were saying, the, the, the commercial uh, approach or the... None of them were that what you would call uh, knuckle busting. No, no. Bill I... had chosen the really, really strong practical commercial stuff. Yeah. Um, but if you if you seriously want to see a uh, clinical approach to sleight of hand, I think clinical is the, the right word. Mm. The the very uh, um, the the kind of finesse that someone will go to to make a, look, a move look perfect, mm -hmm. then Marlowe is is certainly worth. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Marlowe was very he had ways of squaring the deck. He had his own style. You know, I never had the pleasure of meeting him. But uh, our mutual friend Justin Heim used to go over and see him a lot of years ago when Justin was young. And, mm -hmm. and Justin always said to me, uh, I said, was he as good as? He said he was even better. Yeah. And he could do it all. And what Marlo would do when he knew visiting magicians, like well-known visiting magicians from different states in America or overseas were visiting, he would plan, apparently the story goes, what to show them people because he knew what kind of stuff that guy or lady was into. Yeah. So if it was a semi-automatic guy, he would prepare half a dozen, seven or eight different tricks of a semi-automatic nature to try and fool the pajamas out of that person. If you knew that guy was a bit of a moose monkey, Marlo was showing some hardcore technical stuff. Yeah. And he would basically cater that he knew who was coming into town. Yeah. And he would work out a program of effects to show that particular guy that would interest that guy. Yeah. 
and being aware of your audience, being aware of who you perform yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always know? makes me laugh. I always go around my mind thinking, what if Marlo had access to YouTube? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was prolific. He was like a scientist in a lab. Yeah. He would have multiple methods. Some people diss Marlo for, because in some of his books, like the Marlo magazines, for example, very hard to get hold of. Uh, he would have like 12 methods of one particular way of switching aces, six methods of one particular way of, I don't know, setting a key card or whatever. Uh, but I think that's great because it gives you the opportunity to go through those and decide which one you like the best. Yeah. It's almost like a Chinese menu. I'll have one from there, one from there, and one from there. Yeah, it's information. It's resourcing. Yeah. It's re resources that are at your disposal to, to use as you see fit. And more yeah. importantly, those that will fit your performing style. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there may be 101 different ways of, of setting a key card. Yeah. But there may only be three or four that suit your personality and mm -hmm. your performing style. Yes, totally. Um, so, uh, lastly, one another one that I want to talk about before we uh, wrap up and talk about your good self uh, and your publishing yeah, right. uh, is Al Leach. Now, mm. you mentioned the name Al Leach, and a I lot think of that, people wouldn't have heard of him. And I, I think that's a shame. <coughs> because Excuse me. Al, Al Leach had um, some amazing material. Uh, I'll be the first to confess, even though I know part of it, I'm not as conversant as I would I would like to be. Um, but Al Leach. I think he's, he's one of those uh, magicians that's kind of gone well, very much under the radar and has a lot of important contributions. Absolutely. His, uh, you can now get all of Al Leach's booklets as they originally come out, published many years ago in the 50s and 60s by Magic Inc. in Chicago uh, as a hardbound, The mm. Complete Al Leach. Yeah. You do a Google The Complete Al Leach, I'm sure Peter could get, get it in for anybody who's interested. Nice big 200, 250 page book. Al Leach's methods were very simple. A lot of his methods, if you could just hold a little finger break under a card, you you know you could uh, you could do you could do a miracle. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, Leach had a thing like this where you would show a card like that, the three of hearts, just rub it on there, and you get a change. You know, yeah. You know, and that was just a simple thing where you've got a break. You're showing a single card. You're flipping that over, and then immediately it was a sleeve change. I think he called it. Just elegant, you know. Yeah. You yeah. Know, just elegant simplicity, you know. But all of these people that we've been talking about, um, you know, they they are great plots as well. You know, simple plots that people can understand. You know. Yeah, and and everyone that we've talked about, and it, it, you can see why they're your your favourite choices because you can see how they've uh, influenced your work moving forward. Well, if it wasn't for these gentlemen, uh, I wouldn't probably be doing what I'm doing now. Seriously. Right. That's that's and that's the truth. Right. Okay. You know? So you can see the sort of profound effect that that reading about these people has uh, on, on the magic that you do and how it affects you moving forward. Yeah. Um, so John. Um, yes, sir. You have uh, you talked about your new book, um, or you alluded to the fact that you were writing a new book. Uh, when are we expecting that? That'll be out just in time for Christmas, all being well with the stars and the moon aligned. Sort of uh, last week of November, first week of December. And what's it called? That uh, is still to be decided. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, that's still to be decided. So uh, uh, it won't it won't involve my surname because I, uh, I've done that before with one or two projects. Uh, I was thinking of calling it intensive carey actually, but maybe not. <laughs> Get it? Carey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, boom, boom. yeah. Yeah. But uh, now that should be out hopefully uh, uh, by the end of the year uh, yeah. for, for for Christmas. Um, but it won't just be cards in there. There'll be quite a lot of mentalism, mental magic, cross genre stuff as well and uh, one or two other bits and pieces. Uh, it's going to be roughly about 60 items, uh, 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 the way we're looking at it right now. I'm just waiting on some guest contributions from some very well-known people right. who should remain nameless right now. Uh, but uh, you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. That'll be out for Christmas all being well. I enjoy all your work. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, uh, you know um, we also... Um, for Big shout out to Phil Smith, by the way. does all the design work and tidies up my gibberish. Phil is one of the best designers in the business. I mean, I mean look at that, you know. Uh, Phil, that's, that's Phil's work, you know. So, Me, My Cards and I mm. uh, is a book that we have in stock at, at Alakazam. Mm. Um, and I was speaking to you earlier on. Um, I think for the time being, uh, maybe over the, the course of the next few days until uh, Monday, mm. we're going to have these on special offer, okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I think Peter was talking about what uh, what are they price-wise in a moment. I think it was £5 pounds off or something. Yeah, so uh, at the moment they're thirty four ninety nine, uh, but they will be going down to £29.99. Um, there is tons of gold, gold 
in here. Uh, I quite often. Do you want to sign a few of them before I go home? So it'd be a pleasure, mate. Yeah. I think we should do that. I think that would be a great idea. So, guys, uh, these are in stock currently. We don't have massive stocks of, of these, but we do have stock of them. Um, so, uh, if you're interested in a copy, they will be on special offer for the next few days as soon as this uh, goes out live. So, till Monday. And uh, I've only think. got about seven or eight at home. So, once they're gone, they're not going to be reprinted. Um, so, John. Uh, apart from your new book that you're writing, mm -hmm. uh, you have just released a, a new set, uh, a new DVD set with Big Blind Media, I believe. Yeah, Sweet Simplicity. That literally came out uh, yesterday, the 3rd of July. Excellent. Um, and uh, it's 10, very powerful, uh, very simple, uh, but strong card effects. Um, a nice mixture of effects as well, some bit more of a mental nature, some more of physical magic, etc. Absolutely nothing on there beyond the, the scope of any of you guys out there. A lot of fun. It was a great project to film with Owen. He does a great job. Owen's like Peter, you know, he, he, he really understands the business and he knows how to look after people and make them feel comfortable, you know, and we had such fun. And Liam was there, our buddy Liam Montier. So you um, you had done something with them recently, which was Dice Dice Baby, uh, which has been a phenomenal seller for us at Alakazam. Um, yeah, I was quite stoked when you told me earlier. They were uh, flying out the door, literally. Great material. Thank you, everybody, um, for picking it up. And, and different, uh, different to obviously, the card material. Uh, yeah, because totally. it was magic uh, to do with dice. You get um, the dice themselves, beautiful dice, and a nice presentation. Ten dice well. in a velvet drawstring bag. Yeah. And an hour, an hour and a bit uh, long uh, media download. Um, what more could you ask for? Um, good value. Good yeah, value. Very good value. Six mentalism items on there and four things more of a magical nature. A really nice mixture. Excellent. Yeah, I'm proud so, of that. So um, I, I am dying to see an effect from uh, your new DVD. Uh, yeah, so. sure. We'll do just one. It's uh, basically my work on, on something that's quite well known, but uh, I quite like the construction of this. In fact, I like it so much I'm going to stand up and watch it myself. Excellent. <laughs> Imagine we had a pack of cards here, yeah? Yeah. Uh, a pack of cards consists of two types of cards, yeah? You've got the number cards and... Picture cards. That's yes, right. And I think the pictures are the easiest to visualise. Lots of colour, lots of detail, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, the picture cards are made up of three groups of cards. You've got jacks, queens and kings. Which of those three groups do you want to run with? Jacks. Okay, then. Imagine you're holding the four jacks, but you don't need them all. There's red jacks and black jacks. Which colour do you take out? Uh, red. The red, okay, they're gone, leaving the jack of clubs and jack of spades. Which one do you give to me? Uh, the jack of clubs. The jack of clubs, meaning you're left holding on to the jack of spades purely in your imagination, yeah? Yeah. So about one minute, a minute and a half ago, we started out with an imaginary pack. Yeah. And through choices and decisions made entirely by you, we're down to just one card yeah. from 52, the jack of spades, yeah? Yeah. But any card is possible, yeah? Yeah. What I didn't tell you is I carry one card with me in my pocket. It's my lucky card. And I really want your luck to be <laughs> Lovely, lovely. Thank you. So that's a nice commercial approach to the imaginary deck. There's been lots of versions out there, but this version gets to the heart of the effect without talking method. Yeah. Uh, very, very, uh, very, very smoothly and quickly. Excellent. Uh, it cuts out a lot of the unnecessary clutter, I believe. Yeah, I um, think it's amazing. That's called one in 52. Uh, have some fun with that, yeah. Brilliant. That, that is amazing. So, guys, uh, you can find this effect as well as tons of other effects on John's new DVD, which is out and available on our it's website a DVD now. and also a, a, an instant download as well. There we go. So if you want instantaneous magic, check out the instant download. Uh, if you're after a DVD, then obviously that's available as well. Uh, that is available on our website to purchase uh, as of today. So, guys, um, it only leaves me to say just... Thanks to you, John, for coming and joining well, me today. Well, I don't know I've been so serious for about 45 minutes <laughs> in my life, but I've actually enjoyed every flipping minute of this. Oh, thank you. It's mate. been well, great fun because I think me and you are two, like, like two peas in a pod, magically speaking. We have a similar kind of magical education books-wise and yeah. influences and stuff, and this lad does a great job. He looks after all you guys in the customer services, and he's a great guy, full stop. Oh, thank you, mate. Well, guys, uh, I'm going to leave you now um, and just say to you, I hope you enjoyed today's Alakazam video blog. Uh, me and H will be back next week uh, for the Andy vs Harry Challenge. Very excited to see what happens there, as well as other great products. So, guys, it only leaves me to say have a great weekend, a great week, and we will see you next time on the Alakazam video blog. Have a great time, guys.